single time we sit down to record this show, I always find myself wishing that the recording just automatically turned on. Because everybody who's now listening to this, you just missed like a total gem from Tim <laughs> on how he manages his energy and like in projects and in sports. Oh. Which you'll have to wonder about forever because we can't. Yeah, because now it. you're never gonna know because I can't <laughs> yeah. repeat it or it's just awkward. Yeah, but that was uh, that was that was cool. Man. We'll have to we'll have to set this call up so that it automatically records. I think hey, everybody, a setting where I can do it. I'm just nervous <laughs> to do it because like I never know what the fuck I'm gonna say. <laughs> <laughs> it's always like we start this with a deep conversation <laughs> of any crimes that we've committed in the last. Yeah, uh, exactly. Yeah, yeah exactly. before before hitting record. Uh, uh, what's going on, man? Nothing, dude. It's really it's really great to be here. We missed you last week. I had a solo interview, and I was even talking to my dad this morning because I, I wake up super early, and my dad's a, a paramedic in Philly, and he's always up at like four in the morning. So anytime my phone rings at four thirty, you texted me at like five in the morning <laughs> this morning, and I thought it was my dad, which is why I was up. But right after you texted me, and he said, uh. Well, how's the podcast been going? How's the interviews been going? And I kind of told him the whole story about the rebirth, about what we're doing. And I even said, it's like, yeah, I had my first like one on one interview for the first time last week. And I just, I missed hanging out with Ethan so much. Like, I think the, the style that we have right now is a lot more fun. It's a lot more enjoyable for me. I don't feel like pressure to be all prepared and to like have a backup plan in case my interviewee gets like stumped or something like that. So, uh, all that to say is I'm I'm really really happy that you're back and let's let's do this. <laughs> Thanks, man. That means a lot. And uh, for what it's worth, I definitely missed being here last week too. Uh, and I think that's kind of a unique point in any project when you get to the you get to the point where like even when you have a day off, all of a sudden it feels like something's not right. You know, totally. which I actually, to be honest, don't get to with a lot of like I'm that I'm I'm there with writing, and it's actually kind of a problem because I currently work. Seven days a week. Yeah. Because what else are you going to do, right? Also, yeah. It just it also just like it, I don't feel good if I don't do it for at least a little bit. And then now the podcast is that way. So it's it's great to be back. And thanks for everybody who's listening. I think we're going to – we should dive straight into your article thing. And I'll, I'll set it up real quick just to let people know what we're Let's talking about. Let's just dive straight in. We, we did have a plan and Ethan texted me literally 15 minutes ago. And he said, scratch everything. I just read this article that you wrote and we need to talk about it. So <laughs> I'm an open book, brother. Let's go. So for everybody listening, Tim just published an article this week. And well, actually, why don't you take us through the article rather than me setting it up? Sure. Um, High level, what's the big change that's going on in your business right now? I wrote an article on my own blog on timstods.com and I didn't know how to open it because as the copywriter, it's always like, I need a hook. I got to get them hooked in somehow. And so I basically wrote out everything that I was thinking and I came back to the opening line last. And after sitting there again at 4.30 in the morning this morning, like, how do I open this thing? I basically realize that there's no way to open it because this article isn't for anybody but for me. It was just sort of like some journaling that I mean you and I are both notebook people. Like the article is already in this notebook over the course of the last three weeks. I just had to organize it and type it out and put headers in it. And so I said like warning, this article is not for you. It's for me. And sometimes I need to do that, right? Like writing is an emotional process. And I personally am best when I'm writing like uh, emotionally from my heart, you know, telling stories that have manifested themselves through my own life. And I talked about some big changes going on. In a nutshell, the changes are as follows. Copy blogger, which you all know, <laughs> is, is not changing at all. Everything is only improving. The website itself is crushing it with all the SEO work we've been doing. The membership community that we've built continues to, to do really, really well, both like as a business internally, but more importantly, with the feedback I get just from the, the help that people feel like they're getting from our content and from our education. And all of that is staying the same. What we're doing is I partnered with another company called AWAI, who, um, They've had a big impact on my life as well. It's similar to Copyblogger, not just over the last like couple of years, but like I've just learned a ton about writing. They're more like hardcore publishers. 
and uh, not so much bloggers. And they they are very good at like more of the science of long form copy pages. And it's so cool when when you see it all broken down. So I'm meandering a bit. Let me just get right to the point. The point is that we have partnered with them and have combined forces to create a new membership product called Digital Copywriter. You can go to it at digitalcopywriter.com. That's just sort of the the main page. Like you know how trends, if you go to trends.co, it's just an email sign up. Um, and then like through the email sign up, you get uh introduction to the product itself. If you want to see the benefits of the product itself, you just go to my.copyblogger.com. I just published all all the new landing page copy uh last week. I think it was Wednesday. And Wait, can I just confirm that's my.copyblogger or is it my.digitalcopywriter? Yeah. No, my.copyblogger.com is still where the uh, the pages are. I kept all the URLs the same because I have all my email sequences and, and the deadline funnels through those URLs. So I just figured why rebuild all that? It's a pain in the butt. But yeah, I am personally no longer managing the Copyblogger Academy. And in fact, all of the content on the Copyblogger Academy has been absorbed into digital copywriter and not just absorbed like it's a two for one basically because now everybody that signed up for digital copywriter now has all the access to the content that was on the academy and now everybody who is an academy member now also has all the access to digital copywriter so we record this on friday i did all the landing pages and all the sequences uh basically yesterday i hit the final publish button and then when this gets released on wednesday on monday so monday the 16th is when like all the announcement emails go out and so everybody will will know what has happened (laughs) wow big news so basically i mean again to just sum it up for people listening this is almost it's not it's not an acquisition but in in an emotional sense it it's similar in that you're stepping away from one aspect of a product that you've been very close to over the last couple of years. And what I really like about the article that you wrote is it takes people inside the mind of somebody who's going, like who's building something like that and potentially having to make these decisions. So there were a couple of things that you wrote about in the article that I wanted to spend some more time digging into for, for listeners here because we talk, and the reason is because we talk about this. We talk about the model for building businesses. Is like cash flow first, then you build your audience, then you build products on the back end. And what I thought was really interesting about this example is that it shows how it's, I think it shows two things. One, you need to basically try stuff to figure out if it's going to be a fit for the type of like business that you want to build. And in this case, and I think like the flip side of that is like sometimes it's not. Yeah. So in this case, uh, what, what you'd said in the article was like, I love everything about this community. I love this space. But I don't like running membership products because it's it's like a twenty four seven. You have to be on the ball, and it just doesn't jive with the type of business or lifestyle that you're trying to build. So I liked the fact that you were very open about that because it. I think it shows people reading and listening that like yes, we can lay out the model for what these businesses look like, but not it's not one size fits all in terms of what the Back end product is that you build. And sometimes you're going to hate something, or not hate, hate's not the right word. I don't want to say that you hate it, but like sometimes you're not going to like running a certain product type and you have to figure out how to extricate yourself from that in a way that yeah. continues to serve the audience. So talk us through that a little bit more. Some of your thinking on like how, how did you come to realize that this was something that you didn't want to continue managing? And how did you f- go about finding the solution? Because I think this is one that. I wouldn't like, I think a lot of people might just shut down the community and try to figure out a way to do that. So what was your actual process there? I'll start with the second part of that question, because you and I have hinted at this a couple of times and I've explained my struggle to like articulate exactly what I mean by this, because I think it's a philosophy I have that I really, really think other people could use. I just don't know how to like productize it into a cozy little message, you know, like I don't know how to put a tagline behind this, but if you go to 
the one course I've ever created called Agency Clarity is basically all about this idea of starting with a service business, taking this concept of leverage that we all talk about and is like the new buzzword and applying that to people because all the, the Twitter maxis think that like digital is the ultimate leverage. And I suppose in a way it is, but for me, people are still the best form of leverage. And I know that sounds like un- unemotional to a sense, like you're commoditizing people. And then uh, maybe I am to an extent, but obviously like I'm not, like I have relationships with my team. And, and the reason why is because you can build a system of information that can only work with people like robots no matter how sophisticated just aren't going to be able to like process information at least not yet in the same way Hmm. and so through through this idea of agency clarity the idea is you take an agency you build systems of people you do build digital leverage through the court through distribution like we always talk about and then the way to scale an agency is to more or less turn your agency into like a production company where you use the revenue that comes in from your clients and you use the profits to like build other digital companies. Because what's the hardest part about building a a company? Like it's not actually the leverage. It's the the time. It's the work, right? Mm -hmm. It's the waking up at four in the morning to send the newsletter that's due at 7 a.m. Like that's the hard part. That's what makes people quit. And so if you build the people first, then all of a sudden you have this resource you can tap into to build the other things, which becomes scale. And so I, I, I say that first because realistically, in my mind, the entire time, I always knew that the end result for me is to get out of it. I've, I've talked about this book before. I talked about it many times on the Academy, The E Myth Revisited by Robert Gerber. It just totally, totally punched me in the face because I grew up in like a, like a lower income blue collar neighborhood, you know, and I just thought that was life. I thought you woke up early and you came home late and you kicked your boots off. And, and when I discovered that, like, Oh my God, there's another way to do this. It, it really gave me like a, like a shining light to look forward to. So, so I always knew that getting out of the day to day was part of the process, but the, specificity to copy blogger with the membership community was something totally 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 different to me and it was a can of worms that i really 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 underestimated so i'm 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 happy to continue going about that but you as somebody who's involved in that as well i almost want to hear your your feedback on it for sure let me i'll take a brief second to just shout out Sten and John from my team who are the backbone of the support system at Trends. And, you know, our names go on all the articles, but like they're what really keep the ship running in terms of the, the, just the questions, the support, all those things that come in. They don't get enough credit for what they do and they don't get enough attention for their yeah. role in the product. So quick shout out to them because they, they kill it. Yeah, man, it's tough. Like uh, you said a couple of things that are resonating with me. One is that the support component to any product is huge and often, I think, underestimated when people are kind of going in. I also think it's interesting to say that human or that people are like the biggest form of leverage because I I think I agree with you, actually. And I I don't think that this idea that technology is leverage or the biggest form of leverage gets questioned enough. I hadn't thought about that until you just mentioned it, but you're right because it's like people are... If technology, let's say hypothetically, technology was a high form of leverage, but it is, it is a high form of leverage. But the fact that people are what, uh, direct the attention and the like energy of technology is an instant trump card. And so I had never thought about that before. I think it's a really interesting take. Exactly. I wanted to divert briefly just to give people listening a couple of other examples of how this plays out. In other companies, because again, one of the key takeaways for me in learning and reading your piece was that there are different ways to build businesses and you kind of got to experiment with a lot in order to find the one that, that you like. So your concept of turning an agency into a production company, brilliant way of encapsulating it. 
interestingly enough, this is, are you familiar with Rob Deerdeck? Oh, actually, of course you are. Yeah. Of must. course. He, he, okay. So sorry to cut you off. Real quick thing. He was the entire inspiration behind Sober Nation because I grew up a skater and skating was always like, a low life thing to do like my whole childhood was getting kicked out of parking lots and you know just told to to go away by security cars and then rob deirdre came around and he built like a brand around skating and like they looked a certain way and they talked a certain way and so i remember seeing that with uh robin big way back in the day and thinking like oh my god i could do this with sobriety and i could build like a a, a culture around sobriety so rob deirdre has been a huge influence to me for years and years and years, like most of my adult adolescence and my adulthood, because I'm 36 now, which I don't know how that happened. <laughs> <laughs> well, he was on Sam's podcast recently, and he broke down how he actually structures his business, which is really cool. It was it ended up being a fascinating interview. And I think even Sam went into it with like some confused expectations. Like, why are we talking to a skater? Well, it turns out Rob is like, He's brilliant at business, and that was very much on purpose. He wasn't always that way, and he, he went out to educate himself uh, because he built that whole Rob Deerdeck brand, then tried to sell it in like a 360 deal. And bas- people basically told him, like, we can't buy this. You, you've basically built this in a way where there's there's no value here. So he had this huge brand. They were doing like multi-million dollar TV shows, and it had the appearance that he was making money. And he was in his you know mid to late 30s by the time. He tried to sell it and they're like, "Mm, not going to fly. And so he had to start from scratch. Well, as, as close to scratch as you can get as like a, yeah, world famous skater and stuff and completely rebuild. And here's he in that episode, he actually talked through how he structures the company. And I thought it was really interesting. So similar to what you said, he has this like holding company, which is Deer Deck Machine. And that is the production company that owns the rights on like all of his TV. Stuff, which is, by the way, is like a third of MTV's content. Ridiculousness, you mean? Yeah. <laughs> 24-7. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it was so funny, too, because when they were interviewing him, they like opened the show with like, and they were like joking with him. They're like, hey, have you ever heard the joke that like, you know, ridiculousness is just always on MTV? And he goes, well, yeah, it's 40% of the content. <laughs> and it's like, just like, like they've definitely agreed on that. But underneath that holding company, it money gets funneled into two uh, arenas. One is launching brands and they've launched several brands under Gear Deck Machine that have gone on to exit for like multiple millions of dollars. And the second is cash flowing real estate. So that's how his whole business is structured. It's like you use your content machine to launch new brands that make money, eventually like exit. And then everything that you get paid gets funneled back into the back holding into the company. Top. Yep, where you split it between launching new brands and then buying real estate. And then he says, this is what he does. He runs his lifestyle off the cash flow from the real estate. So I just thought that was really interesting. It's interesting to hear the overlap between how both of you approach these things. And I think that model definitely has legs. You reminded me of something else related to community building, but it's slipping my mind right now. So the other thing, I'll I'll put a pin in it. And if I think of it, I'll, we'll come back to it. But the other thing that you had talked about is you you said you want to kind of take a break before doing something that's next. Was there some financial component to this that allows you to take a break? Or is it just because the businesses are are still kind of running in the background? It was both. As somebody that needs to finish things that I start, I knew I just needed... like I, I couldn't let, leave my customers hanging. And so really, if, if, if I'm, I'm being honest... Financially, the entity of Copyblogger Media does better than I expected it to. And a lot of that has to do with just because I'm like, I'm a good lead gen guy. Like I really am. I, I can, I can just like crush it. And so when we started digital commerce and I knew I had like a, a awesome SEO entity behind me and I, I saw what I could do with Copyblogger, like we've just closed a ton of business over the last couple months because of that. So financially, yes, there was like a benchmark that I felt like I needed to hit before I could just kind of take a deep breath. Really, I don't even know if that benchmark made any sense. It was Mm -hmm. just sort of like a a, a spot where I could look at and be like, okay, let me get there. And I don't even know if that's like a positive thing in my life. It's just if I don't sleep, (laughs) really, unless I 
I hit that benchmark. So I, I did hit the benchmark, but you know, truth be told, and I suppose this is like some of the emotional aspects of the article is I, I hit that benchmark a little while ago. Like I, I've been there for some time. I felt like I would be letting people down if like I wasn't front and center in the way that mm-hmm. I envisioned I would be. And so I, I was wrestling with that for a while. Got it. And you're open about some of these numbers. Like you said, uh, I forget which is which, but like one of them is doing 40K a month right now in business. The other one's doing like 80K a month. And then Stasi's doing several multiples of that. Yeah. So I just had this fascinating conversation with this guy. I won't say his name yet because I'm not sure he'd want me to share his name, but he's a member in the Trends Group. He had a life changing exit from a company. They had built an eight figure business and sold it. So like many millions of dollars, uh, in his account and then ended up in his own words, kind of out over his skis, overextended because, mm. and it was really fascinating to talk to him. I, he shared this fact inside the community. He's like, Hey, somebody had asked, Hey, I have like 35 grand sitting in cash. How would you guys invest this? And he says, first thing to ask yourself is, do you, like, do you have an emergency fund? Do you have 12 yeah. months of expenses liquid? Yeah. Or like, you know, it qu- quickly liquefiable, liquidatable. And he said, cause if you don't, don't even think about putting this anywhere illiquid. Mm-hmm. And he says, take it from me. I like had a life changing exit and then got way out overextended, spread too thin. And it's a real problem. So when I saw that, I reached out to him and we had this conversation and wow. he ended up breaking down this framework for how people should think about what to do next after an acquisition. And again, this is not an acquisition, but it is kind of similar in that like a project is coming to a close. You've hit this kind of financial benchmark and now you're like looking at what to do next. So I wanted to just share some of the things that he talked about in case anybody listening to this feels like they're either approaching or maybe in the similar position where they're like going through an acquisition or maybe they've just gone through one. The problem is can be summarized like this. There are two different mindsets that come into play when it comes to wealth building, there's wealth accumulation and then there's wealth preservation. Yeah. And there's a, there's a trick that nobody tells you about, which is that the type of person you need to be in order to preserve your wealth is different than the type of person that you need to be in order to acquire it. And the problem is that there's a slight lag, usually, in, especially in an acquisition, right? Where there's like an earnout or something like that. So that your financial position actually changes slower than your mindset needs to change. And nobody realizes it until all of a sudden you have continued living like somebody who's in acquisition mode well into when you should be in your preservation mode. And then you like very easily can end up in this situation where you're screwed. And I had never heard of it put that way because like obviously everybody listening to this knows about earnout periods and stuff like that. But I had never thought of like how dangerous that lag really can be to your overall wealth if you're not prepared up front to change your mindset about yeah. how you're handling money. So in his situation, he went through this period where, you know, they had the acquisition and then he was flush. So he was, he continued to live like somebody who was pulling in, you know, millions of dollars a year mm-hmm. from a business, like from a sellable asset. And he bought companies and he invested in friends companies and he like on paper, all, a lot of those investments are still doing great, but they're very, very illiquid and you can't yeah. touch them. So here's what he said. This is what you should think about for for anybody listening to this who's kind of going through this, preparing to go through this. Prepare yourself now because the earlier you think about this, the better. He says there's basically like three steps to the equation to kind of nailing the acquisition and making sure you don't overextend yourself. The first is related to the stories we tell ourselves about money. Like what stories are you telling yourself about whether you're in like an abundance or scarcity mindset and like what stories are you telling yourself about what kind of spender you are? He yeah. says it's really important like to just before you do anything, just park your money for a while and really get in touch with the stories that you've internalized as an entrepreneur related to money. The second step is developing like a really detailed understanding of risk adjusted portfolio theory. Like how mm-hmm. do you build how do you build a portfolio with this money that's going to actually protect you in the long run? And then the third step he was talking about is like social accountability. So you have to get people, a group of people around you who are there. He said their purpose is not to double check your investments, right? It's not to do that. It's a group of people that you can tell them, Hey, this is what I want out of my life. This is my plan. 
And then when you come to the table, you say, hey, this is the decision that I'm going to make. Their job is to check the proposed action against your stated goal mm. and say, it's not, is this a good investment? Is it a bad investment? It's, is this in line with what you said you want or not? And he said, like, that could be so helpful because if anybody had just kind of gut checked one or two of these long term investments, sure. it would have very easily shown. So that was a little bit of a side tangent, but I wanted to get into it because you had said, you know, you're getting into this phase where you just kind of want to take time and think about what's next. And it occurred to me that a lot of people go through that and not everybody has been through it enough times to really know how to navigate it. So how are you thinking about it right now when you're thinking about like what's next? What's what's kind of on your mind? Well, first off, I think what he said was very smart. A lot of that has to do with, I don't know if you ever read The Psychology of Money by Morgan Housel. The first law of human psychology of money is that nobody is crazy. It's just like everybody has a mental framework around money built on how they grew up with money. So like you might look at somebody and think like, oh, I can't believe that person spends money like that. Or like, come on, live a little bit. Like, why are you saving? And like, both of them will look at each other and think that they're crazy, but no one's actually Mm -hmm. crazy. You just have like a personal understanding. And so, yeah, that's a really great book. Um, The Psychology of Money is a super simple read too, very conversational. I love what we're doing with this pod. I have every intention to keep doing this. I have every intention to keep SEOing the Copyblogger website. The whole reason Copyblogger was exciting to me in the first place is because of the backlink profile. You know, like what an idiot I was (laughs) to buy a website, a certain amount of equity in a website. Obviously, Brian Clark is is still my partner and and very grateful to to be partnered with him. But to buy into this website that had no cash flow attached to it, if I didn't see some kind of like intrinsic long term value. And so the game I love to play is long form writing and long form content. And I have every intention of going head to head with Neil Patel and going head to head (laughs) with some of the other big blogs out there to try to gobble up some of these keywords. I'm going to do it a little bit different though, because I, I like copy is not an internet marketing website. We're, we're writing website, like digital marketing, digital marketing via long form writing by proxy type deal. So I'm going to keep doing that. You know, man, like I've, I've never been in this experience in my life because I've always had so much nervous energy always. And I don't even know where it comes from. Sometimes I feel like it's a good thing. Sometimes I wish it would just leave me alone. And just for the first time in my life, you know, I'm like, I am chilling. Mm -hmm. I love the work that we're doing. Uh, I'm I'm like excited to be a little bit creative. I'm really excited about some of these things that I wrote about in the article, some of these ideas that I had, especially this, uh, this SaaS product. So to, to summarize, you know, two things. I relate to Rob Beardick in that my wife and I both completely live off of my Stasi salary. You know, it's, it's about 10 grand a month. Like I don't spend any more than 10 grand a month. And that includes all the traveling that we do. And that's my wife and I and, and our kid. And it's actually like a lot of money, but I don't go without, you know what I mean? So I don't ever want it to seem like I only spend 10 grand a month. Like that's a significant amount. And I'm, I'm very lucky for that. But the point I'm trying to make is I'm like by no means tapping into a nest egg. And I want to keep doubling down on like, what we started here, what we did with Copyblogger, just because I'm leaving the day-to-day operations of the product doesn't mean by any means that like, oh, wiping my hands with Copyblogger, throw that in the portfolio. Like, not at all. Now, now I think I'm like more dangerous mm-hmm. because I just get to focus on the stuff that I really love to do. And then, yeah, the, the alumni assistant, I know the treatment space really, really, really well. And I always am a little... I always do double takes with SaaS products sometimes because I think a lot of them are like solutions to problems that don't exist, right? But this is a real problem that exists in a like in an enterprise market, by the way. It's not direct to consumer, which is another thing about SaaS that I don't like. If it's an enterprise SaaS, you can charge way more money and deal with a lot less hassle. And uh and I I'm pumped about that, man. So I'm I'm chilling. I'm drinking coffee. I'm journaling. I'm <laughs> kicking and punching the bag. I'm going to the gym every morning with my wife. I'm, I'm good, bro. Biden, Biden time. Yeah, hey, it's bro. it's tough, man. I was thinking about the same thing today. I, I, uh, on a drive home, I was thinking to myself because you know I'm I'm chipping away at this journal project in the background, and 
uh, currently I'm working with a freelance editor to finish kind of editing the book. And I have not been as responsive to her as I should have been. And it's mostly just be- it, like what I realized on the drive today was it's because this is not my first priority. It's not even my second priority. And I started just kind of mulling over, should it be a priority at all in that case? Because it's like, I, I mean, I go days without responding and I'm not sure that's a good thing. And I was thinking like, well, if this isn't what I'm going to spend my time on. What would I spend my time on? You know, I think there is a skill that entrepreneurial type people need to develop, which is like satisfaction or something related to maybe like stepping purpose. outside your comfort zone. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's like, dude, there's like a whole life out there to live that's yeah. not involved yeah, with yeah. building businesses. I don't know. I'm, I guess I'm kind of in this place where I'm thinking, well, maybe the time and money that I'm investing into this would actually be better just spent on like a cool ski trip. You know, <laughs> like, can I just burn cash on things that would be fun? <laughs> I don't know. So it's definitely something I'm thinking about. And I think it's something that a lot of people struggle with. I mentioned this, this thought about communities that I wanted to come back to. I think it speaks to the bigger challenge here that you ran into, which is, you know, there's a community that you don't necessarily like sort of the day to day, the, 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 the nitty gritty behind the scenes, the stuff that you never see about running communities. Yeah. For people who don't necessarily have the option of a partnership right out of the gate or who are maybe thinking of experimenting with a community, I wanted to lay out one or two other ideas that I've seen implemented that have been really helpful for people. And this is like especially practical. I think there's a few areas where this is going to be really important. One's for newsletters. Because there's a lot of people who try to build paid newsletters and there's some community component and they're just launching the newsletter. And so to like launch a newsletter and a community at the exact same time is a big deal. That's not an easy thing to do. Yeah. And like when, the, when trends did it, we did it with, you know, our daily email was generating millions of dollars a year in revenue. That makes it a lot easier to do a project like that than if you're, you know, just if you're writing a, a free email. And it's making like $200 a month or something like that. So these are heavy, heavy lifts. They're not, it's not easy to do, but if you're going to try and do it, one thing that you can do, which is really effective is to bill in quarterly segments. And the reason for that is, first of all, I see a lot of people bill monthly out there for newsletters and stuff like that. I actually recommend billing yearly. And Me the too. reason, yeah. It, I mean, it, it just gives you a lot more working capital, plus, you know, avoid some issues with credit card processing that we don't have to get into here. But if you are going to bill on a shorter term than annually, you should look at quarterly. And the reason for that is because you're never more than three months from shutting down the community. And yeah. so if you, yeah, you get into this situation where maybe, uh, and like, again, this is even more pertinent for people who are building their own thing for the first time. Maybe they don't know yet if it's like real passion. You get into it, you don't like it, you can grit through anything for three months. And then you let the thing down easily and you haven't disappointed any of the people that have given you money for something. Um, the other thing that I wanted to call out is that I've actually seen, so this was interesting to me. I took Sam's copywriting course recently and it's kind of cool. It's just like a 10 day course where he sends you like, each, each morning you get an email with an example of a cool copy written page and some notes from him on why it's cool. And then you're supposed to hand write it 10 days in and out. And the very last day, he starts the email by saying, like, a lot of you are asking if we're going to have a community for copy that, which is the course. And he goes, uh, the answer is absolutely not. <laughs> He's like, and he says, why? And this is the kind of the cool thing that he does. He goes, uh, because like, Frankly, there are other communities out there that are way better and I don't want to run a community. Like I know yeah. that I can't come close to what these other communities are doing in this space. So if you like them, just go check them out. That's what you're looking for. Like you came here for the course, go there for the community. And I don't think a lot of people are making that distinction these days. Everybody thinks you have to do everything and you just, you don't. I am so relieved to hear that. There's two things that come to mind. And, and I'm glad that we're, we're talking about this. I was hoping that this was going to be a question because it's always the go-to for people that are building an audience. You know, like, well, I'm going to get an email list and then I'm going to launch a community. And I- I'm supportive of that. Like, it's a great model. I- obviously, I'm having success with that. I'm not knocking the community. I just think that 
people look at digital monthly membership and they think that it doesn't mean working with people. And so I'm always kind of confused when people say like, well, why would you start an agency when you could build a SaaS? And it's like, well, an agency, I have like 30 people I have to deal with. With a SaaS, I got like 30,000 people I have to deal with. You know, like where did we come up with this idea that one of them was like less labor intensive than the other? And it reminds me, there's a, there's a really, really talented woman out there. Her name is Emily Mills. And I don't know if she listens to the show or not. I, I hope she does. She used to live in Nashville. She was one of my bird, my bird friends. We would always send pictures of birds. She moved recently to, uh, to Oregon, but she's an illustrator. And she reached out to me once saying like, Tim, I just want to ask you a question. I launched this community with my illustrating brand. And she's got like 12,000 followers. It's really cool what she does. She goes to, um, conferences and as the conference this is her business like as the conferences is going on she's up front with like a big whiteboard and she just illustrates the story so it's kind of like a live version of those whiteboard youtube videos that you see right and then she rips it out it's one of those like big big paper things and so when i say rips it out she's literally ripping off a big piece of paper and like sticking it at the front of the conference afterwards and so like everybody can gather around and it's like a visual representation of what they learned and it's a really cool thing she had great business and she reached out to me. She's like, man, I, I'm struggling with this community. I thought people were going to buy it more. Like, what advice do you have? And I, without a single hesitation, I said, don't do it. <laughs> like, <laughs> shut it down. This is hard. This is so grueling. And, you know, there's, there's like a, a, a cost per hour average that I think people don't look at that much. And, if you were to take it without the community, because, you know, people say, okay, I can do a newsletter. Maybe I got 19 bucks a month on like a high end newsletter, or I could do a community and I can charge like maybe 49 bucks a month. If you want to get like real, real top level, most likely 29, I'd say. So that extra $10 a month per member, you know, let's say you got a hundred members. That's what a thousand extra dollars a month, but you're going to be working way more than a thousand dollars worth. And so. People just don't fail to recognize these nuances where it's, it's not like some free monthly cash flow machine. Like the work you have to do to make people happy, answer people questions, answer people's questions. It is very, very, very significant. And so, and so the best part about it is that AWAI, like they have this down already. They have a right. whole team of team people that do it, you know? And so like, I just, I feel so relieved that. I would be devastated if I got to this place and had to like pull the plug for myself, for like the customers, you know, for all the work we put in. And I'd be so, so crushed. And so I was like really blessed to be able to make this relationship with Rebecca. And I know that it's going to be even better than it was because, you know, it got some idiot like me, like, you know, <laughs> being the anchor on this ship, dragging this thing down. So I'm, I'm thrilled. Yeah. I think finding the right team for a soft landing is definitely. Yeah, uh, definitely key. And and also, like, if there's another lesson there, too, which uh, this is actually, I learned this when I stepped away from my last job. So I was in this hyper growth startup doing community work, by the way, which, you know, anybody knows, it's hard, but it's also crazy that it's a real job. It's a total privilege, because my job was to like, fly around the world hosting crazy events for smart, interesting pe- people. <laughs> and at that point, I just had decided that I really wanted to be a writer. And I, and I was, you know, 29 or something. I, I, re- I was getting up there and just hadn't made real progress toward that goal. And it, I just had this moment where I was like, I gotta, I gotta make a change. And I was very nervous to step away from the project. This is the, this is kind of the point. I was nervous to step away. And it was actually my boss who sort of taught me. He's like, well, I think a lot of people are afraid to step away from a project because we create this false duality in our mind where it's like we either stay and it succeeds or we leave and it's a failure yeah it's like the actual the reality is you can leave and he's talking about you can leave as a success but he was talking about like specifically finding the next job so i was like well i don't know if i'm gonna be able to find a job as a writer and he goes well you may leave here and find a job that pays you more than you get paid here like the the point is not that uh like don't fear walking away Because in walking away or changing your focus or whatever, you can actually create an outcome that's better for everybody involved. And that was an important lesson for me. And now that's one of the ways that I sort of battle test any decision that I'm making is like, 
am I being fearful here because I'm assuming it's not going to work out this change, you know? And in some way, like you find the right partner, it can totally work out. So that's a great lesson. Me too. And I, I guess to summarize this thing, this, this sort of brings us back around. I, I didn't want to harp on this too much because I, 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 I felt like digging into community would be a really valuable topic for people who listen to this podcast to hear because I'm sure there's, there's people listening thinking that, that that was my goal. I want to build a community. But in the gentleman that you interviewed, he said that the third thing was to have people around him that can bounce his idea and correlate that in the direction of like what his goal is. That really stuck out to me because I, I had an executive coach for a while and she really, really helped me. And basically every single conversation came down to the same exact thing. And she called it the ultimate outcome. She was like, is what you're doing going to get you closer to or further away to your ultimate outcome? And I think that's like, I'm getting a little heady here. I've spent a lot of time thinking about this, as you could see from my journal that I was talking about before. But I think the people go to community because it's, it's like an easy thing to put in there. You know, like, yeah, I'm going to build an audience and I'm going to build a community. But I don't think a lot of people take the time to ask themselves, like, is this getting me closer to or further away from my ultimate outcome? And for a lot of people, I think they say my ultimate outcome is going to be to write and to create a newsletter. And then I can do that anywhere in the world. Believe me, if you have a community, you are not going to be able to work on your own time. You are just not. You're going to have to immediately stop for urgent refunds, people that didn't know they were getting charged again. And I'm not, again, like I'm not complaining. These are just things that pop up in this mm -hmm. kind of business. Yeah. Um, and so to, to bring the, this whole thing back around, like, my ultimate outcome has always been to build a production company that can essentially manage a lot of the work for me so that I can write in my blog. <laughs> it's like, that's, that's really what I want to do with my life. Like, I want to write books and I want to write in my blog and like hang out with my family and work out. You know, that's, that's really what makes me happiest and what takes me out of my, myself. And so I, I, it, it was, it was, it was when I was in Portland, Oregon. I can remember the exact moment when I looked over to my wife when I was working and like I was hold, hang, holding up the hike that we were going for. And she understands because it's an urgent thing. I was like, look, I cannot go right now. I have to figure out how to fix this problem. And I just knew I was like, this is not in line with my ultimate outcome. And it was the very next day that I reached out to Rebecca with AWAI and I was like, Hey, I got this idea. You know, like, let's, let's make this better for all of us. And, uh, and I, I think we did. I feel, I know we did. I feel super, super confident that like what we did is even better than it was before. And so like everybody wins. Yeah. Well, I think part of the evidence of that is that you're still holding the company, right? So it's got to perform. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Otherwise yeah. you're just losing money. Well, thanks for being so open about this stuff, man. I think it, I think it's really cool to talk through this because people don't always, people don't often get a window into what this looks like especially in a six figure business that's just that's operating at a high level. Yeah. Uh so hopefully this was interesting to people listening. Anything else you want to say before we wrap this up? No man. Great to see you. I'm happy that we're doing this. I have a I know that this is going to be the kind of episode that is really really going to speak to people and I I I suppose to wrap it up is I'm very very grateful that uh when People here are, I, cause it's hard to be like vulnerable in such a public setting sometimes, you know, but every time you and I have had these conversations about like what's really going on behind the scenes and like this is the reality and these are some of the fears and you're not the only one thinking this. I promise you, you know, we've always gotten such really, really positive feedback. So I, I, I hope that we were able to give some positive insight to anybody that may be toying with some of these ideas. And, and if we have, Reach out to me. Reach out to Ethan. We're, we're both here to like to chat through some of this shit with you. So, so thank you. Second that. Thanks for listening, everybody. This was great. We'll catch you next week. 